You are listening to the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, episode 26. This week on the show, we're going to continue our duck profile segment and feature the Northern Shoveler. And then we're going to talk a little bit about gaining permission to hunt on private property. All right. Welcome to this week's episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. We are your on-demand audio source for all things waterfowl and waterfowl hunting. This is episode 26 of the show. You can find all of our episodes at uh, hpoutdoors.com, as well as on iTunes, has all of our past stuff on there. And you can find us on all the social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you've got a question or comment that you would like to share with the show, you can give us a shout on our HP Outdoors hotline at 724-609-FOWL. That is 724-609-3695. We've also got a uh, newsletter opportunity that you can sign up for on our website at hpoutdoors.com. If you'd like to get some uh, periodic updates from us in your email, feel free to sign up and do that. Joining me today on the show, as he always does, and I got to find a better way to introduce you, Dan. I feel like I've been doing it the same way for the last couple of episodes, but it's it's Dan Harushka. Dan, what's up, man? <laughs> yeah, I think you do every episode, so 26, 26 going on. No, but, that's yeah, it. doing that, well. Uh, that's inaccurate. That's not an accurate statement. <laughs> <laughs> no, I got a couple of animals in there and a couple other name calling, but uh, doing well. Um, we're coming into the second to last weekend of our goose season for the year, and it's kind of crappy because actually this Saturday should be pretty good, but we have we got about two and a half feet of snow mixed with ice on fields, and it's just it's pretty tough right now for sure. I mean, there there aren't many birds around and just kind of difficult yeah that sounds great but you and i both know the truth and i'm not going to let you lie to the listeners of this show tell everybody what you're really going to be doing on saturday oh well i have twin girls and a boy coming in may and the wife does want to go look at minivans so (laughs) that 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 might be on the agenda but we haven't haven't confirmed it yet Mm, I'm sure it's not confirmed. Um, yeah. Well, I'm I'm full on hunting withdraw at this point. Our season's closed. I was gonna get out last uh last Sunday, the last day of the season, but we had like thirty mile an hour sustained winds, so it wasn't really worth doing. So um kinda went out on a quiet note this year. Um unfortunately I didn't get out a whole lot actually after our trip down to the eastern shore. So um kind of bummed out in that regard but you know feel like i had a good season overall but i'm definitely in withdrawal and just trying to kind of keep going here until spring turkey season gets up and it warms out and can do a little more fishing and you know get outside and do some more things but you know pretty much just like everybody else you know cold and windy and just kind of bearing down trying to get through it so why not talk about waterfowl hunting on the podcast and uh you know this week we've got a couple things that um I think actually that this time of year is perfect for, and that's getting permission to hunt on private ground. And I mean, if you're a guy out there that is tired of hunting, you know, overcrowded public land and things like that, um, you know, this, 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 this show is for you. We're going to give you tips and techniques and really just the confidence to be prepared to go up to someone's door knock on the door and, you know, secure permission to hunt that property. So, we're going to cover that in pretty good detail and, you know, a lot of different things we're going to show, share with you there. And then we're going to profile the, uh, the Northern shoveler, the spoonie for this week's duck profile segment. Um, you know, so good show to come Dan. And, um, you know, we've been getting a lot of good, uh, a good, a lot of good conversation going through our, uh, Facebook group that we have the HP outdoors waterfowl podcast listeners group on Facebook if you search that, you can uh, request permission to come in there and chat with us. And, you know, there's been a lot of good talk in there recently, Dan, about shotguns and techniques and things like that. And, uh, you know, I think that that's really, the group's really been growing a lot. And I think a lot of guys have been getting good information out of the dialogues that come through there. 
Yeah, it is. I mean, it, it's not just waterfowl too, you know, just a bunch of guys chatting like you're out at duck camp. So, um, you know, if you want to, if you want to join up and chit chat with us while we're on that topic, I don't think I told you, did I tell you that I, I started a diet? Um, you didn't formally tell me, but reading the tea leaves on your little Facebook posts and stuff, I can tell that you're, you're working out or you're trying to do uh, something over there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying. So, I don't like New Year's resolutions because I've never kept one. So I figured I'd wait till like end of February to start. Makes so, sense. yeah, you know, but, um, so I started, you know, I cut soda, um, and pretty much I'm kind of keeping it to almost like a paleo type diet. I have no know, idea what the, that means. Well, it's like a caveman. So if a caveman can eat it or find it, then you can eat it. What? So, yeah, pretty much like meat, chicken, salad, like a lot of the good stuff I eat anyway. And it's pretty much just like, well, yeah, it started with that picture that I put up at work of all the, like the pizza and all the candy and stuff. Well, usually I would just demolish that and I really need to, <laughs> I, I, I really need to get away from it because I would just sneak to the kitchen and, you know, get a coffee and a freaking, I don't know, just a donut or something. Bear claw. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean, whatever it may be, but I mean, it, it really. So anyway, I mean, right now we're recording on on a Thursday, but I've went all week, no soda, no candy, and no bread. And it, you know, I've I'm I know it's a lot of water weight, but down almost five pounds in four days, and I feel really good, and uh, hopefully just get a lot of energy back. So that's kind of my my end goal. So this isn't like to get cut up and and look good on the beach this is more like blood pressure cholesterol insurance premium diet oh yeah yeah yeah, nice. yeah we get you know we do the insurance testing every year and you know my cholesterol is pretty good but it's you know we could use some work so <laughs> i figure cut it, <laughs> cut out the sugars and the breads and and all that jazz so i'm i'm working hard if anyone so back to the main point if you want to come into the listeners group on facebook and chat about any kind of diets or root me on or if you need help then you know we can kind of chat about being each other's support system so that's where that was going. I'm sure a lot of people are going to be in there rooting you on. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. I need it. Well, I'm with you in spirit. I'm I'm going to keep talking about hunting ducks and stuff, but uh, I support your efforts there, there guy, and hope you, hopefully you can stick with it. Um, all right, let's uh let's go ahead and get into this week's uh caveman meat part of the show here for you, and uh, we're going to profile the spoonie northern shoveler. And um, I have I can't say that I've ever killed a bunch of these ducks. Um, I know we killed at least one this year that I can recall, but I don't really remember seeing a bunch of these around our our neck of the woods here, kind of growing up. What What about you? Nope, never killed one. Yeah. Hmm. Well, you don't seem don't seem too often, but yeah, I know I know there's some places where they just pile them up. Um. But I just don't think our area is one of them. But let's go ahead and uh, and get into it and profile this week's uh, Northern Shoveler. All right, the Northern Shoveler, a.k.a. the Spoonie. The male and the female, they're both about 19 inches. The weight comes in at about one and a half pounds. And obviously the most visible characteristic of the Northern Shoveler is a large spoon bill. And it almost looks like a beaver tail if you've never seen it before, but... The males, are, they're really pretty. They have an iridescent green head and neck, a white chest and breast, and a chestnut belly and sides. Chestnut like my beard, kind of like a canvas back. They have a white stripe extending from the breast along the gray-brown back and white flank spots, and the wings have a gray-blue shoulder patch, and that's separated from a brilliant green speculum by a tapered white stripe. And the bill is black in the breeding plumage, and the legs and feet are orange. And the female northern shoveler, they have a light brownish head with a blackish crown and a brownish speckled body. And the upper wing coverts are grayish blue. The greater secondary coverts are tipped with white, and the secondaries are brown with a greenish sheen. 
and the bill is olive and a little bit of fleshy orange and speckled with black dots. And the Spoonies breeding, they breed in parklands and mixed grass prairies of Canada and the grasslands of north central United States. They prefer a shallow marsh that are mud bottomed and rich in the invertebrate life. And they, the nest sites are generally located on the ground in grassy areas uh, lacking woody cover and away from the open water. And they're rate right on average with most other ducks laying around nine eggs. Yeah, when it comes to their migration and wintering patterns, the shovelers, uh, they fly from the, peri- per- bleh, the prairie pothole region uh, down through the Pacific and Central flyways. And they winter in areas like California, coastal Louisiana, Texas, Mexico, uh, in the north and central highlands of uh, you know Mexico specifically. Wintering habitat for them will include fresh and brackish coastal marshes and ponds. Uh, you know, saltwater wetlands are generally avoided. And uh, the northern shovelers are common uh, winter visitors to Central America, the Caribbean, northern Colombia, and can be found uh, occasionally all the way down into uh, Trinidad, research has shown. As far as the population of the northern shoveler, it's uh, quite remarkable, actually. They've... Um, the populations have remained fairly steady since the you know mid fifties. Uh, more recently, in two thousand thirteen, population surveys came in at about four point eight million birds, and then uh, in two thousand fourteen, uh, surveys came in at five point two million birds, which is basically eleven percent increase year over year, and over a hundred and fourteen percent of the long term average. For food habits, the northern shovelers feed uh, by dabbling and sifting through, you know, shallow waters, eating seeds, um, you know, sawgrass, smart weeds, pond weeds, algae, duckweeds, things of that nature, as well as aquatic insects, mollusks, crustaceans, um, you know, and and uh, sort of the normal stuff that dabblers dabblers feed on. So, um, lots of lots of northern shovelers out there. Population is doing good. So uh, keep your eyes to the sky next fall. You're likely to see one. All right, Dan, Northern Shoveler in the books. And, um, you know, we've been doing the duck profile segment here for quite a while. And uh, we're kind of winding down as far as various duck species. And it won't be long here. We're going to transition into some geese and talk about, uh, you know, the various types of, uh, you know, you know, white front, you know, white geese, Canada geese, um, brand, all that kind of stuff. So if you're a goose hunter, we haven't forgot about you. And we, we're going to get to your stuff here. Uh, in the next couple weeks. So uh, stay tuned to that. And um, kind of a little side note, we will have some different stuff coming to the show in the next couple weeks as far as segments and uh, things that we're going to do. So we're really excited about that. But uh, nothing's firmed up yet, so I'm going to kind of keep that just as a little bit of a tease before we kind of, you know, release any of that stuff. But, you know, Dan, we, we're trying hard to keep the show, inter- in, you know, interactive and, uh, you know, engaging for, for everybody. So, you know, we're working hard on getting different things that we think people are going to like to hear, especially as we get into the off season and, you know, not everyone's focused on duck hunting as much and you got different things going on. So, uh, looking forward to doing some of those, uh, those segments. I know. Yeah, there's, I think, uh, we're going to come up with some interesting topics and, and like you said, new segments and, uh, I, I, I'll listen to us if no one else will. I think it, it's going to be <laughs> it's going to be interesting. So stay tuned, and uh, you know we'll definitely be bringing you interesting facts here. Yeah, you know this this week's uh, segment that we're going to talk about as far as getting permission on on private ground. I I think most people probably think that it's more of a a summertime activity. You know, late summer into the fall and and throughout the season, of course. Um, but I actually think that. This time of year right now, as the seasons are wrapping up and closing out, is one of the best times to 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 get out and knock on doors. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So let's go ahead and roll right into it and uh, get into the main part of this week's show, how to get permission uh, to hunt public ground or public ground, to hunt private ground. All right, so... When it comes to this topic, everybody's got various opinions and techniques and tips and that kind of stuff that, that they find that works for them. I want to caveat this by saying these are just 
our ideas and things that we find beneficial, it may not be something that would work in your area particularly. Um, so, you know, take it for what it is as far as just a, you know, another set of eyes and another viewpoint on how to go about doing this. And, um, you know, Dan and I, we really haven't compared notes too much. And we did that kind of on purpose because, you know, he lives, you know, where we grew up and it's a more rural area where, you know, there's not as many people and a little bit easier to get permission where I live in a very dense populated area, you know, less than 30 miles outside of Washington, DC. And, uh, you know, it can be tough, quite frankly, to get permission on private ground for a multitude of reasons that we'll go into. So a couple different perspectives here on, on how it goes, but I think to start, I pretty much everybody would agree that, you know, gaining permission on public, oh, I keep saying that gaining permission on private ground is a numbers game. You know, you're not going to get a yes every single door you go to in in every farm that you visit. So obviously the more farms that you go to and the more, you know, doors that you knock on, the more likely you are to gain access and the more properties that you're going to get. So, um, you know, I think that's, that's one thing to keep in mind. You're never going to gain access to the property that you don't go and talk to the landowner. It's just that simple. If you're not out knocking on doors, you're not going to get going to get permission to hunt anywhere. So um, if you're one of those guys, like there's a lot of out there that are unhappy with their hunting situation for whatever reason, you know, public ground, you know, not a lot of birds, a lot of pressure, those sorts of things. The only way that's going to change is if you make a change, you decide that you're going to get out and you're going to knock on the doors and do what it takes, look at the legwork and, and all of that kind of stuff to, uh, you know, to secure property. So that's what this, this episode is geared for. And I want to start to say why I think this time of year is a good time to do it. I think that it's important because birds are still on that late season pattern. So, you know, you're seeing the fields that they're hitting this time of year where I'm at. I see birds in the same fields this time of year, every single year. So, you know, it's good to target those, those fields or the fields in the areas where they're hitting or the flight paths of where they're hitting, you know, if you're going to work traffic, if you can't get on the X, that kind of thing, but to just kind of build that, that network of the area that the birds are working this time of year. And then also it gives you a full year essentially to build that relationship with the landowner. You know, if they want you to work on the farm or whatever it may take for you to get access to it, you give yourself as much time as possible to try to earn their confidence in you. And quite frankly, not many people are out, you know, hitting the road this time of year. They're you know, wrapping up the season and they're getting ready to pack up their gear for the year. If you're the only one out there, you might have a better success. So I think it's a good time of year to give it a shot. What do you say, Dan? I would say absolutely. And, you know, the last time you were up here and we had that quick hunt, um, And I got out of work, but, uh, actually the field that we wanted to be in, you know, is the last, I think it was the last week in that area and, um, we're kind of sectioned off in different areas, but the, it was the last week of that, that area season and we couldn't contact the landowner. We just couldn't get in touch with them. So we went to a field across the road, thought we could pull some, which we, we did end up pulling some over, but, um, we went back to that landowner and already have permission for next year. So, um, that, I mean, it is a great cause. And, and actually the, the place that we were hunting on, you know, when we asked them permission, we said, you know, could, do you mind if we hunt here? And, and he had no problem at all. And we asked, you know, are, do other people have permission? Have other people been hunting this? And he said, you know, a couple asked, you know, back in the fall, but I haven't seen anyone all year. So, um, like you said, it's a great time because you might be the only person out there. And that was exactly the case that we had not too long ago. Yep. So don't discount this time of year. And, you know, and it's another thing to get you out in the field and doing something waterfowl related before spring turkey season, you know, comes in. So let's talk about some of the things you need to do before you get started. You know, before you ever knock on the door, what are some things that you should consider? Uh, For me, You know, it's the old adage, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. So, you know, dress decently, um, you know, I'm not saying you need to wear like a suit or anything like that, but just look respectable. I mean, think about it as if you're the landowner, you know, what would you want someone to look like 
that's coming to ask permission to hunt on your property, you know, chances are these home, you know, these landowners, these farmers, they're going to, they're going to form an opinion on you before a word comes out of your mouth. You know, the second they see you, they've already got something in their mind is the, you know, as far as an impression about who you are and what, what it is that you're there to do. So try to be as, you know, as, as positive as you can be, you know, in that, that initial interaction, you know, they always say camo is a bad thing to wear and all that kind of stuff. I, I don't know if it is or not. I mean, where we're from in Pennsylvania, a lot of people wear camo all the time. So I think you just have to kind of know your audience a little bit and know, you know, what type of people that you're going to be dealing with when you're knocking on these doors. So do whatever is appropriate, you know, for your area, I guess is what I would say there. Um, what are some other things that you think, Dan, as far as uh, before someone knocks on the door, what should they consider? Well, I was going to say, you know, you're you're going down that road already. But make sure that you do go and ask permission in person. I mean, you are, it's like sales. You're selling yourself. And like you said, if if someone owns a bunch of property or say a pond be, behind their house that you want to hunt over, they don't, you know, they don't want to call. And then sometime, you know, before sunrise, just a random truck pulls in and starts hunting and shooting right as they're waking up like that. That's not a good way to go about it. So make sure you're going in person. And I know, you know, this is very social media age and a lot of people have a difficult time going up and talking to people. You know, it's all, it's all digitized now, but there's nothing like a handshake to go and, and meet someone. Even if you get a no, like you said, it's not going to be a hundred percent success, but go and get in front of these people and don't, I mean, don't call them. It's just not, it's not right to do. Well, here, I'm, I'm going to offer another view of that type of thing. And where you're, where where you're at and the, the places that you're going, I agree with you. You should, there's no reason you can't go to the door and, and that kind of thing. Where I live now, um, it's a different ball game. You're, you know, where I'm at, you're talking about multimillionaires that have horse farms and gated driveways and just no physical way to just roll up to the door and no trespassing signs on the front gate. You know, they make it clear they don't want you in there. Um, You know, these people have, you know, horses, you know, that they're boarding there that are super expensive and just tons of liability, you know, all that kind of stuff going on. So, you you have to be careful there. Um, I'll give you an example. When I first moved down here and I was, I was still deer hunting a lot. I used a letter and I sent, we have a lot of wineries in the area. I sent a letter to 30 wineries of which six responded. I'd say, um, if I recall, four of them already had groups hunting their winery. Two of them actually gave me permission through the letter to come to the, to, to come to the winery and meet them and basically, they were already granting me permission when they called me. They were like, we got a deer problem. We need them, you know, whatever. Come out. We'll, you know, we'll show you where you can go, that kind of thing. So that was incredibly effective for me. I've used it in neighborhoods around here where there are large subdivisions. And, you know, they're on 10-acre plots maybe. And, um, you know, I don't want to drive back into their property and, you know, knock on the door in the evening time. So I'll drop a letter to them and say, you know, this is who I am. This is why I'm writing you. And I'm also writing you because this is a less intrusive means to ask the question than to me. Just so I, I basically word it in the letter as I'm, I'm doing this out of respect for your time. And, you know, if this is something that you're interested in, that you're willing to consider, here's my contact information. Please call me at your earliest convenience. If they're interested or they're willing to let you hunt, they'll call you. If they don't, then you'll never hear from them. But I mean, I've had a lot of success people calling me back from the letters that I've sent them based on asking for permission specifically for deer hunting. But you know, if worse came to worse, I would certainly do it for waterfowl hunting as well. But there's just times when people, you know, they get home from work, for example, and you know, they're spending time with their kids or whatever, and you roll up there and you know, they just don't want to be bothered at that time. So the letter was just a way for me to sort of dip my toe in the water, see what kind of interest was there and then put it in the hands of the landowner to, to make the next step. 
it was it, it worked for me a couple times you know got me some places to hunt which is great but like i'd say like like you said if i can get to the front door without being too intrusive i'll, I'll do that but you know I, I think that there are other sometimes given your situation you have to creatively think about how how can i get access to these and maybe you know some different different ways to go about it so that's kind of what i stand on right. what do you think about that yeah i, I mean it it worked on a few places that you know you got to do what you got to do and that that seemed to work and one thing one thing he did say was you know don't be intrusive on their time and even when you even when you're talking with them don't keep them longer than what they want to be you know if if they're trying to get back on their tractor or back to their house to dinner like you were saying you know you know kind of let them go don't be chatty Cathy the first time that you're there and I don't know. I think sometimes that's a, a turn off to people. Yeah. I, I'm going to hit that in just a minute. I wanted to add a couple more things here before we get to that point. Um, before you go to the door, two more things that I want to add. One, if you can find a landowner's name, do that. So whether it be through public record or, you know, the neighbor or whatever, if you can walk up and say, excuse me, Mr. Smith, or excuse me, you know, Mr. Jones, whatever it is, saying someone's name has incredible weight lots of power makes them know that you have at least put in the time to know who they are. And you're not just, you know, looking at them as it's just another person, what have you, you know, sir, ma'am, things of that nature. Those carry a lot of weight can get you a lot of long ways with folks. Um, also I'm not a fan of like a business card per se, but I am a fan of quickly being able to leave them your contact information. However, that might be, So that if they're busy, when you first stop at the house and they say, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't know if I'd have any problem with that, but you know, I'm, I'm running out the door or whatever, you know, make sure that they have a way to reach you. Or maybe they say, Hey, you know, I got somebody that hunts it now, but, um, you know, if, if, if they stop hunting it or whatever, an opportunity comes up, I'll give you a call. Make sure that you, you know, you have that and don't be like, okay, well pull out your cell phone and let me, let me key it in there for you. That kind of thing. Make it quick, make it easy. But you don't want it to be like, you know, professional goose slayer dot com, like on your business card type of thing, if you know, you know what I mean. So figure out what works out for you there. Um, But to your point, Dan, that you just made, I think that's incredibly important. If you roll up to a farm and the farmer is farming, don't get in his way and stop him from doing what he's doing to ask him to hunt. I mean, that's his livelihood. Think about that. Like, would you want someone to come into your office and asking you a question out of the blue, taking time away from you making your, you know, your, your family's earnings, that kind of thing. Be mindful of that. Don't go too early in the morning. Don't go during dinner time. Be very cautious on Sundays. You know, if people are in church and things like that, you do not want to be, you know, um, encroaching on time if they're spending that with family stuff. Be smart about when, when you go and try to catch them maybe, you know, uh, after lunch before they head out to the field or, you know, right before lunch, before they're coming in, something like that, you know, try to be mindful. And, uh, you know, like, like Dan said, don't, don't be super long winded, be conversational, be likeful, but get to the point, you know, they're going to know that you're a random person showing up out of nowhere for a reason. Get to the question. Um, you know, let the rapport build come through that process of asking the question, not, you know, showing up and asking about his kids and that kind of stuff. Cause he knows you probably don't care. He wants to know why you're there And the longer that you drag that out sometimes can be detrimental to you. So get to the point and, uh, you know, get on with it and expect no's. <laughs> I mean, quite frankly, expect a no, uh, the, especially the first time you're there, expect it that way that you're not caught off guard. And you know, that kind of thing. Most people were going to tell, you no. um, there's a lot of different things that I think you should do after you get the no, but I'd like to hear your, your opinion on it, Dan. What do you think? You know, how likely, how likely are you expecting to get a no? Um, it depends. And kind of, you know, we, in your general area, you kind of know who hunts where and, and what the, the farmers are like. And most of the time you don't get, a a direct no like just no like usually they'll say you know we have i gave permission to two groups this year 
and you know make sure you come back after season because I'll give I'll give permission to two groups next year or something like that or you might get a a response is you know no my my nephews hunt that or my grandson hunts that but there's not too many there's not too many people around that just give you a straight I mean in if, this area if, if, in this if, area if you get my nephew hunts that that's code for no I mean he's saying the same thing yeah right so you know however it comes out uh, you know if it's not a yes <laughs> whatever they say other than yes is a no it's you know it's essentially the same thing but people like you said they're non-confrontational in general so they're not going to be like no and get off my property or i'm going to call the freaking cops on you uh you know for the most part you're not going to get that unless you're a jerk to them but like you said you're going to get a lot of different no's and that's perfect as to kind of what i wanted to lead into with this um so if you get a no in whatever form or fashion, what do you do? There's a lot of different things you can do. And one that's popular amongst, you know, whitetail hunters, for example, is um, if you get, you know, no for whatever reason, ask for permission to do something else. Like a whitetail hunter will ask for permission to go shed hunting, for example. And, you know, so you're not hunting, but you're, you know, you're getting your foot on their property and that kind of thing. For me, it's usually photography. Can I take pictures of the, you know, the waterfowl that you have on your pond or this, that, and the other, or fishing? Do you mind if I'd come up and, you know, fish one afternoon in your pond or, um, you know, bring my son up here and, you know, fish for some bluegills or some panfish, whatever it is. Um, you know, those are great ways to sort of grease the skids, you know, and kind of open the door to building the relationship and fostering it with them. And quite frankly, sometimes if you start that way, it could flood right into it. For example, if you say, hey, you know, sir, I noticed you got a bunch of geese down in your pond. Would you mind if I take a picture, you know, go down and take some photography of them? Oh, yeah, I can't stand all them geese down there. They're, you know, pooping everywhere and all this other kind of stuff. Boom, you follow that right up with the hunting, you know, with the hunting permission and you may be in. Um, you know, so it's a, it's another good way to to kind of broach the topic. What do you think, Dan? I think that's pretty slick. <laughs> 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 to be honest, you know, usually... I don't know. I mean, that's that's just a good a good way to go about it for sure. No, that's one that I never thought about, and I like well, it. And I mean, where we live, right where I live right now, people in general are going to be very hesitant to let you come on their property and, and shoot guns and la 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 la. You know, that's that's it. So there's ways that you can kind of build into it, for example. But like this gives a perfect opportunity to build a relationship. What I mean by that is. You can get onto the landowner's property. You can show them that you actually respect it. You don't leave garbage. And one thing that I always did when I was down in, in college, if I would hunt on private property, I would bring out garbage that I found on their property. And I would make sure to stop and thank them. And they would see that I had a handful of you know, pop bottles or just whatever it may be, just some random scrap that was on their property. And it always seemed to, you know, get a smile and that, you know, as you said, building a relationship, that's, that's what you're doing. And that's what you want to continue to do so you can hunt on their property. Yeah. Whatever, whatever it is, whatever that, that means of brokering the relationship, whether it's shed hunting, photography, fishing, um, I don't know, like hiking, metal detecting, just cleaning up, whatever it is. Um, don't be afraid to use those is into a, you know, to help you kind of get your foot in the door. Um, you mentioned earlier that it's, you know, it's like a sales type situation. And, um, you know, having a sales background myself, I look at it as exactly that. I'm, I'm selling you something. I'm selling you me and the idea of me hunting on your property. So, when I get a no in whatever form or fashion, they give me that no, I immediately put my sales mentality on. And I'm not saying I'm like, well, let me sell you a used car here. You know, it's not that it's, it's a technique and a strategy that I employ when I'm doing sales and, you know, in a professional environment or at a farmer's, you know, front door. So there's a couple basic steps that you, you need to do in my opinion. And, um, I'll share them with you and then I'll put them into practice for as an example. So if someone gives me a no, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ask why. And I'm not just going to say, well, why? You know, like, well, why is that an issue? Basically, 
I'm going to say, you know, Mr. Smith, I understand, you know, what is it that you have, you know, is there, is there a particular concern that you would have about me hunting waterfowl on your property? Then he might say, well, yeah, actually I let somebody, um, you know, hunt my field last year and they drove their truck through the field and rutted it up when I told them, you know, not to, so I'm not, they ruined it for everybody. Then the second step of the process for me is to acknowledge that concern. Don't act like it doesn't happen. The guy's obviously been burned by somebody. Acknowledge that show empathy, you know, say, man, hey, Mr. Smith, I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that. You know, it's really unfortunate that the guys didn't, you know, follow the guidelines and, and listen to what you, what, you know, what you asked of them. The third thing, overcome the objection. So you have to show him why that wouldn't be the case for you, you know, but okay. So, you know, I, you know, that, that's, that's really unfortunate. The guys wrote up your field like that. I'm really sorry to hear that. Let me tell you, know, this is what I would do. If I was given permission, I would park up here on the road by the gas well that you have on your, on your farm, if that's an acceptable spot. And I would walk all of my, you know, my decoys and my gear down to the field. I would walk the edges of the field so that it not disturb any of your crops or anything like that. And then I would go out into the field into the area. You know, is that something that you might be open to considering given the bad experience that you've had with guys driving trailers and, you know, and trucks in your, in your field in the past? He may say, yeah, I'd be really appreciative of that. If you're willing to do that, you know, and he might give you a chance because you've built that little bit of empathy right there just before that saying like, Hey, I know that that's, that stinks for you. And that sucks. Like, this is how I'm going to be different. It might work. It might not, but it gives you that little bit more time to be in front of that, that landowner after he's given you the no. So there's a lot of different things that you can do in that scenario. But what do you think, Dan? You think that that could be effective? I think it's perfect. And, you know, as you were sitting there saying that, I mean, that's, that's the go-to and it's very, you have to be very careful on, on how you ask your follow-up question because it could come, you don't want to be brash with it, you know, to say, you know, is, is there a certain reason why you don't allow people or, you know, I mean, just be very, be very gentle with that because some guys just, they don't, they don't want to have it. Or if, if you are too pushy with it, they're going to shut it down right away. And I think that that's why it's so important to expect the no, because if you're expecting a yes and he says no, and that catches you off guard, you're more likely to react inappropriately and, um, you know, not with the, the right tact. So instead, if you say, um, you know, he says, no, I'm not gonna let anybody hunt here in, and you follow up with, you know what, sir, honestly, I completely understand. And I, you know, I can imagine as a landowner, you get a lot of guys coming in here and asking you to hunt and you've probably had some bad experiences in the past. Do you mind me asking, you know, what are some of the things that guys have done in the past that have turned you off to it? And maybe he'll share with you a couple stories and he doesn't even know it yet, but he already likes you because you've, you've already shown that you care about him in his experience with hunters in the past. So it sounds kind of corny, but like, that's the type of things that you need to build. I mean, he needs to know that you're not just some, you know, uh, idiot that doesn't really care about his farm and his operation because that's his livelihood. That's how he makes his income. You know, so you need to show him that you respect that. Um, there's some other ways that I think you can build credibility when you're talking with somebody about, you know, objections and overcoming them, you know, uh, some of the guys that I know that have the best hunting access in the world are police officers. God, it's like a built in, just freaking credibility all over the place. So, you know, <laughs> you know, bring, if, if you're a law enforcement officer, bring it up, you know, say, you know, you know, sir, I'm a law enforcement officer, blah, 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 you know, use those sort of things for me, not a law law enforcement officer. You know, I, I, I talk about things like, uh, you know, oh, well, you know, the reason why I came to your, your property, sir, is I've actually got permission from, you know, uh, Mrs. Jennings down the road. Oh, you know, Barb. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And like, so, you know, so the, automatically that, that gives you a little bit of, uh, help if you, if you say that another one of my favorites is, um, you know, bring up a conservation organization. If you work with your DU chapter, you know, if they've given you some, uh, you know, pushbacks about guys leaving trash or not picking up shell casings, things of that nature. You could talk about how you're active with your local DU chapter and, you know, you guys go out twice a year and you clean up after guys that do the exact same things on public ground marshes and wetlands and that kind of thing. So, you know, showing that you're not just the normal guy, you know, you've got something else 
different about you that shows you have a little more compassion, a little more empathy for their property, it's going to get you a long way in my opinion. And it's just like sales. You know, when you go to buy any kind of product from anybody to store, the last thing you want is someone to be pushy and annoying. You know, when you go to buy a product, you want to buy from somebody that you like, right? I mean, that makes the, that makes the process more enjoyable. It's the same thing when you're getting hunting permission, be likable, yep. you know, be a human, show some compassion and, be tactful in, your, in explaining as to why you're going to be different than the guy that screwed him over last time. And I think that's going to get you a long way. Yeah. And and be be able to relate to your area or the, the landowner or whatever they have. You know, if you go out and just, uh, I'm, I'll take back to, you know, turkey season when you came up last year. Yeah, I went into the guy's barn and um, I started asking him questions about his car. He's an old, he's like 75 underneath the car. So I started asking him questions about the car. I talked to him for probably 15 minutes before I even asked about turkey hunting on his property. But just to, you know, like you said, building relationships show that, you know, you care about what they're into a little bit or care about, you know, problems that they had. It, it does go a very, very, very long way. Yeah. And I want to just reiterate this one more time because I think this is, what can separate a lot of people from getting property that don't? And it's the same thing that separates a good salesman from a bad salesman. If you take the no in whatever form it comes, no, nah, I let my nephew hunt back there. No, nah, I've had problems with guys in the past. No, nah, I don't let anybody ever hunt in here. If you leave it at that, you will get it. You will never hunt that property and you'll never hunt anybody else's property because 99% of the people are going to tell you no in whatever and however they do it just because it's easiest for them. It's just easiest for them to say no, and you turn around and walk away, and that's it. If you find out the why, the why behind the no, what what is it? You know, tactfully, again, if you figure that out, acknowledge that concern. Do not blow by that. Take the minute, just the second, to say, I'm really sorry to hear that. It's unfortunate there's guys out there that, you know, treat your property like that, and, you know, I wish that hadn't happened to you. And then overcome it, show them why, you know, I've had it. We, my local ducks unlimited chapter was in a similar event where we went down to a local wetlands and there was a bunch of beer cans and beer bottles left down there. And we took an afternoon and cleaned it up because, you know, we've seen guys do the same types of things at those properties that you're talking about, you know, haven't happened on your farm, those kinds of things. If you do that, you may not leave there with a yes that day, but if you go back there down the road and talk to the guy again, you're more likely to get a yes somewhere down the road if you hadn't done that. So I think that that's really important. And I, you know, I don't, I don't want to over, you know, gloss over that point because I think it can be literally the difference maker for a lot of guys. So. Yeah. I was just going to say, you know, when, if you are, if you're driving around scouting, if you see birds in the field, the first thing, I would check out the property, you know, take a look at it, think about where you would actually hunt. And, you know, you mentioned, you know, if, if I would hunt it, I would park up on that, you know, on the gas road and, and walk it down. And I think that that brings up a very good point. If, if you are hunting farmland and, and I ran into this, this, um, this past fall, I went and asked permission. And the first thing I saw was a guy's, uh, where he had all the cows and whatnot went to a certain portion of his farmland and then he had a couple fields. And when I asked, I said, you know, I, I noticed that your pasture goes out there, you know, a good ways. I would, you know, are you willing to allow people to hunt on, on the back end of that? Or, you know, do you have any restrictions regarding, you know, your beef cattle? And that's to show that you have looked at how they benefit, you know, their livelihoods and not just, you know, I'll just pop in here and, and check it out. Like, I think that that also goes a long way. Yeah. And that would be like the perfect example of if, if you were to get a no and the reason for that is because, well, I've got beef cattle out there and you know, I don't want you shooting at them or whatever. Okay. I, you know, I acknowledge that you know, that's a concern for you. That's how you make your living. I respect that. You know, however, if I was a hunt out there, this is how I'd set up. I'd set up with my back to the pasture so that there's no way that I would possibly shoot near, you know, towards your cattle. Everything would be out of way, that sort of thing. So it's a great point, you know, pay attention to what they got going on and, and uh, consider that. So 
all good, really, really good stuff there that um, I think a lot of guys, you know, a lot of guys probably do that. I don't know if we're, you know, breaking any, you know, rec, you know, any uh, new information here, but, um, <laughs> you know, I think it's something that's worth bearing out for maybe somebody that is just getting started and hasn't taken that step yet to start asking for permission on private ground. And they've just been doing the public land game. So uh, think about those things. And I can promise you right now, you will be more confident at the door knowing that when you get the no, you're equipped to handle it and at least continue the dialogue. After that, he may say no again. That's okay. But at least you've made him consider how you could be different and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, it could be the difference. But uh, another way to go about it, too, is to think about what you can offer for the landowner. You know, this is a real common one. Everybody wants to, you know, say, well, I work on your farm if I want you to, that kind of thing. Um, I've actually never had a landowner take me up on that offer. Most of the time it's, oh, that's what I got grandkids for. I got, you know, nephews and whoever else that they put, you know, put the work out there. But the fact that you offer, regardless of whether they accepted it or not, is the point. Make sure you offer it. And, you know, if you have the ability to offer any kind of professional services, that I've seen that be really beneficial for guys. Um, you know, if you own a landscaping company and you got like a bobcat or a fence, hole, you know, with a hydraulic post hole digger on it or something, and you can offer to say, hey, you know, hey, for permission here, you know, if you allow me to hunt, anytime you need any kind of this work done, you give me a call, I'll come up here and help you out, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I've seen a lot of people get access to properties like that because they have those means. Of course, not everyone has those, but you just never know. Um, so if you've got something that you think you can offer them that they could be benef- that they could benefit from, don't hold any of that stuff back either. Make sure you get that out on the table. There's actually one of the landowners that I have permission on um, not too far away, probably about 500 acres that they own along a stretch of a road. But if I do not go and shoot groundhogs in the summertime, I'm not allowed to hunt waterfowl there. So that's something that they run over it with their tractors. If they have cows in the, in the pastures and you know, they're, that's something they don't want to deal with. I have to go and, and let him know how many groundhogs I've killed to obtain permission for that waterfowl season. <laughs> I, I, I can think of worse things, you know? I mean, oh, I mean, I, I, I'm not complaining. I go down there, you know, before sunset and, you know, pick them off. And I mean, they're, they are all over the place. So, you know, I have to hunt to be able to earn to hunt. So that's all right. Yeah. It's all about finding what it is that, 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 that landowner benefits from and what they value. Um, you know, so we've talked about ways to overcome it and things that you can offer and all that kind of stuff. But again, I want to reiterate, there are some people that were going to say no, no matter what, and there's nothing that you're going to do to change that. So, you know, give it your best shot. Don't be combative. Always be polite. And if they say no at the end of the day, then, you know, it's going to be a no and and you kind of carry on. But, um, you know, don't be afraid to revisit those folks once in a while and and see maybe something will change and, um, you know, they'll have a change of heart. And, uh, you know, if you've been the persistent face that they recognize from however many times you've been there in the past, you may get a shot at it at one, at one point or another, but you know, some people just may never come around to it and, you know, and that's okay too. Um, you know, I, I don't around here where I'm at leasing gets, it's kind of, it's, it's a big thing. You know, a lot of guys lease out property and it's sort of a pay to play game in a lot of areas. Um, I know up your way, it's not so prevalent. The point that I'm trying to make here is, um, try to avoid the lease talk as much as you possibly can, because when you open that box, rarely can you kind of ever, you know, get, get it back closed again. Anytime money gets brought into the table, you're pretty much kissing your chances of hunting it for free. Goodbye. Um, I don't love the idea of, of leasing for waterfowl simply because if you don't have enough spots leased up, you can really overpressure it and not be real fruitful anyway. Um, so for me, I'm less likely to entertain a lease unless it's just an absolutely, you know, ridiculous spot or that's just the the nature of the beast in the area that you live um you know i i t- tend to lean more towards a trespass fee if i get a no and it's because they want some money um 
I would ask them if they're willing to pay a trespass, accept a trespass fee, meaning the day that I want to hunt there, I would pay a small fee per guy or whatever it is that you agree to hunt that farm for that day. But you're not going to shell out money and lock it for the whole year. The drawback to that is you're not going to probably have exclusive rights to it. But the benefit is, you know, if you get one or two good hunts out of it a year, at least you're only paying for one or two times and you're not paying to have it for a full year. But I know you guys don't really have to deal with leasing too much your way there, Dan. So I don't, I don't think that this is probably something you cross over too much. Do you? No, not really at all. And I, I'm the whole leasing thing. I mean, if you're, if you're a guide and you know, you have, you know, 15, 20 farms, you know, that's, that's one thing, but if you're a single guy or a group of four guys and you know, you you don't have income like a guide would, you know, it really, I, like you were saying, I don't know how beneficial it would be to start leasing properties, especially if you're talking about fields, because depending what they plant and uh, certain times of years when they pick, like it could be not fruitful at all. You know, you could have a, a year or two in a row that you never even see a bird in that field. So, um, you know, it's, that's, leasing is, like you said, try to avoid it at all costs. If there is, you know, I would, the only thing I would probably consider around here leasing would be some, you know, ponds or some, some beaver ponds, swampy areas, stuff like that. If someone owned it exclusively, but there's so much, uh, public land available and water sources that I think there's a lot of other places to, to find a spot. Yeah. And it's not like that everywhere. Unfortunately, it's not like that where I'm at here, right. but you know, the leasing thing is just, it's just, it works against the hunter, you know? I mean, because once you lease one spot, not only is that place never going to be hunted for free again, that's always going to be leased, but you know, that stuff spreads like wildfire, you know? So the neighbors are going to know. And pretty soon properties that you might've hunted for free they're going to start wanting money and that kind of thing. So um, try to find other ways. Um, you know, some people will place a really heavy value on having responsible landowner or responsible hunters on their property that they know they're going to take care of it. They're going to keep trespassers off and they're going to treat it like they would treat it as, you know, as their own. So people value that. And, um, you know, they'd rather let you on there for free knowing that you're going to do that rather than have somebody lease it that's going to trash their fields, leave the gates open, let let the animals out, all that kind of stuff. So um, never sell yourself short in the value that you could provide that landowner in, in those areas. So um, another thing that is very important, in my opinion, is be knowledgeable of the local state, you know, liability laws, policies, regs, that kind of thing, and educate the landowner if necessary. I've got a really, really good example of this. So again, I live in Northern Virginia, suburbs everywhere, blah, blah, blah. I have permission to archery hunt a three acre house property in a suburb that's owned by two very influential lawyers. So knowing this going into it, I had all of my regs up to speed. I had printed documentation of the liability laws and everything else. And when I, we started the, the discussion about me hunting the property and I presented that, that's all they needed to see because knowing that they were lawyers, they cared about the law and they wanted to know where their exposure was if something were to go bad. So knowing that in the state of Virginia, if you do not charge a hunter to hunt on your property, if you allow them free access under the state law, you are not liable for their activities on your property. So if they were to fall and break their ankle or, um, you know, damage someone else's property in the act of hunting, the landowner is not reliable for that. Now, if you, if they charge you as the hunter to hunt on their property, now they're responsible for liability insurance and would likely, if they know what the heck they're doing, would require the hunter to buy a liability insurance policy that covers the landowner as well. So, being that I had these documentation ready for them, they read it overnight. And the next day they were said, you're good to go. So when I first started hunting there, it was like, you know, call us the night before so we can notify the neighbors and blah, 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 blah. Now they're just so tired of these deer pummeling their bushes and stuff. It's basically like, don't even worry about it. We've talked to the neighbors. They want them taken as much as we do. Just go ahead and go. Like they don't, they're, they've become so comfortable um, you know, with the, with the arrangement, and everything. So, you know, it's likely it's one of those things where it can be a 
pain in the neck when it when you first get started because they're going to be as cautious as possible in the beginning but it won't take long to build their trust and 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 things will lighten up and it'll become more uh you know user friendly for us as hunters but i think it's important know the liability know how far you need to be away from dwellings um you know if you've got farmers that have or you know uh, horse farmers and things that have uh you know, ponds with lots of geese sitting on them. You can talk about the damage that they cause and how they can contaminate ponds and make livestock sick and things like that. All of that is just power, you know, that you can keep in your back pocket to use to help convince the landowner why they should let you hunt. Um, I don't know if you've run into anything like that up your way, Dan, but um, I know we sure get it a bunch down here. Yeah, I think you you need to cover your bases a lot more thoroughly than we do. But I'm still waiting for that first selfie when you're on someone's back porch with a, a dead deer right under. <laughs> well, I hope it never happens. Um, <laughs> I hope I hope so too. But oh man, I, I mean, I, it, it gets close quarters down there. Some oh, it's it's it's. I mean, I'm literally in these people's backyard because their whole property is three acres. Not all of that is wooded, so it's very <laughs> tight. But I'm incredibly mindful of where I'm shooting, where the deer could run, where it's likely to run and that sort of thing. So it's not the easiest place to hunt, but there's a bunch, there's a pile of deer in there. So, um, you know, it's kind of worth it on that, that regard. And I can hunt deer here till like end of April. So it's two seconds from my house and it's a, it's a nice spot. But, um, what else, Dan, what else do you think is important when, uh, you know, talking about gaining access to private ground. You know, I mean, you talked about roles and laws of the actual state and and whatnot, but, you know, the landowners might have some laws of their own and just make sure you follow those and, you know, don't try and sneak anything by them. And going back, I'll go back to that, um, the guy who I asked permission from for the turkey season and the first one of the first things he asked me was how many guys are coming with you you know because he's had where he gave one guy permission and then uh, say for opening of deer uh, deer rifle season they had three trucks pull into his driveway and he's like i gave one guy permission and now there are you know eight guys getting out of vehicles going to hunt my property so you know be just be very upfront with them you know i mean we talked about building relationships again but be truthful, be honest, and, you know, tell them what your intentions are. And just the more comfortable they are with you, the better. Yeah, I think that that's a good point, especially when you're talking waterfowl hunting, because likely you're going to be out there with a buddy or two. And, um, you know, you need to be up front with them about the number of guys that you're going to have in the field and things like that. So, and, you know, and some of that other stuff you're talking about, that that falls in, in under more of the uh, – how to maintain, you know, the access once you get it, which is kind of a whole yeah. other thing. I mean, that's another, you know, Christmas cards and Thanksgiving, you know, turkeys and hams and, you know, birds that meet if they want it and all of that kind of stuff. That's probably a conversation we can have, you know, another on another episode someday down the road. But because, uh, yeah, once you get the permission and you get the property, it's as much work, if not more, maintaining it and keeping it year after year as things change and you know that kind of stuff so yeah the gratitude the gratitude definitely should not be overlooked even if it's cookies or stopping by to say hi a lot and that's another thing you know a lot of well and and i'm speaking to around this area again but you know older farmers and whatnot they sometimes they just like someone to talk to and to go and spend a half an hour hour chit-chatting about the the old days and you know just and I'll tell you, I'll be honest, those are some of the best conversations I've ever had. So it's not like it's a waste of time. Yeah. I mean, that, that's just being a, being a human being, you know, being a good person, I think is a, a lot of, a lot of what you're getting at there. And if you've got another tip or technique that you've used successfully to obtain permission and you're willing to share it with us, we'd love to hear from you. You can shoot us an email at HP out or info at HP outdoors.com. Uh, shoot us a note over at Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, call into our hotline, 724-609-3695, any of those means, and share with us what you use to gain access to private land and, uh, you know, things that you might be able to share with the rest of us to kind of help us out in our areas. Um, anything else, Dan, you want to add to this before we, uh, before we move on? Uh, this not so much, just it, 
it's starting to get depressing knowing that season is a week from being over. So it's, it's a sad time. Okay. Well, that's unfortunate, but at least you've got one <laughs> week left. I've got none with no weeks left. So let's go ahead. <laughs> let's go ahead and uh, roll in here to the end of the show. All right, Dan, that pretty much covers the uh, caveman diet portion of uh, the show. Um, anything else that you've got that you'd like to add on here before we before we get into the end here? I mean, there's there's meat, there's fruits, vegetables, nuts. You know, it's it's a pretty wide diet. Um, you know, just trying to cut dairy and the cheese. I think cheese is going to be my toughest. So, but we'll stay with it. But no, and honestly, um, you know, I, you'll probably hit our spot, our partners, but you know, we appreciate them. And, and again, I appreciate everyone that we contact and or that contacts us and uh, that we're always talking to online and whatnot. It's just, it's good to be a part of that community. Agree. And the partners that you mentioned, we'd like to thank who, uh, at least in part, bring you the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, Sitka Gear, Sport Ear, Big Al's Silhouette Decoys, Bison Coolers. And don't forget that you can use the HP Outdoors discount code to get $15 off any hard side cooler through Bison Coolers and Backwoods Decoy System. So thank you to them. And if you're in the market for any kind of products that they may uh, offer, please consider them uh, when you make your purchase. Um, all right, Dan, I think this has been a good show. I've really enjoyed the discussion about gaining access to private ground. It's one of the, uh, holy grails of hunting, you know, uh, you own you can't have good hunts if you don't hunt good spots. It's just the way it is. So hopefully you guys found that to be beneficial and informative. And like we said, if you have anything to add to that discussion, please feel free to share it via any of the various uh, forums that we have. So, um, Without further ado, let's go ahead and uh, put a bow on this show with this week's parting shot. So this week's parting shot deals with something that Dan and I talk about a lot on this show, and that's dealing with the weather. So today in the Washington, D.C. area, we reached the lowest temperatures in the last 120 years or something like that that I read for this time of year. So it's been really cold. and It's been cold across the entire nation in a lot of different areas. The thing that I want to mention here is don't forget your pets. You know, you read a lot about um, pets being outside in the cold weather. And, you know, I know a lot of situations where the you know dogs have to live outside for whatever reason, you know, uh, cats, things of that nature, whatever your, your pet is. But um, don't forget them out there. If they have to be outside, make sure that you've got appropriate bedding and warming or a kennel run or something like that for them to keep them, uh, you know, protected. We talk a lot about you know, when to not take your dog out hunting because it's too cold and that kind of thing. Um, just because it's not hunting season, you know, don't forget about them and, uh, take, take the the necessary precautions to bring them in and, uh, make sure they're not out shivering, you know, all night long and that kind of stuff. So, uh, stay warm out there and, uh, keep your head up. Promise you spring's coming. All right, that's going to do it for episode 26 of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. We hope you guys enjoyed our discussion about getting permission on private ground, and we hope you enjoyed our profile of the Northern Shoveler. If you want to catch up on all of the older episodes of the podcast, check us out on iTunes. If you haven't had a chance to do so, please feel free to give us a rating and review. It would help us immensely. Um, that's going to do it for this week. So until next time, for Dan, I'm Josh. Take care. Take care.